In the article Barometer of Life by Stewart et al. from 2010, it is noted that it is time to accelerate taxonomy and scientific natural history, two of the most vital but neglected disciplines of biology. Hello, my name is Eric and I am a student at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. At university, I study the fields of biology and education. Today, we are going to combine the two disciplines as we discuss the topics of identification and biological classification. Let's get started. Over the past 10 years, my professors, several other students, and I have been researching the effects of climate change on species diversity and productivity in California grasslands. More specifically, we are studying a small meadow in the Angelo Reserve in northern Mendocino County, California, to see how change in rainfall patterns affect diversity and productivity. I realized that I just threw a lot of information at you in a very short period of time. And you might be wondering, what is species diversity? What is productivity? Are the predicted climate changes enough to affect either of these things? And finally, what do any of these things have to do with identification and classification? Now let's work on getting some answers. Species diversity is defined as the total number of species in a given area and their relative abundance. Here, we have eight species, each in equal abundance. Productivity is the amount of material formed by an individual, population, or community in a specific time period. For example, this species of California redwood has been known to grow over 350 feet tall and weigh over 4,000 tons, having much higher productivity than this California poppy. You could also relate productivity to the analogy of a professional athlete who lifts and eats to gain muscle mass versus the average person. The professional athlete is typically much larger and therefore has higher productivity in terms of overall mass gain. The climate changes we are considering for our research are varying amounts of rainfall, which we have manipulated in accordance with two different climate models. We have yet to determine the long-term effects of these changes on the meadow. Science is a process requires the analysis of a large amount of data and often takes years to see results. So now that you have a little background information, let's get to the point. What does this have to do with identification and classification? Let's focus on the topic of identification. Identification, according to Webster's Dictionary, is using proof or evidence to identify an object. Recall that in our research, one of the main points of interest is species diversity. As you can imagine, it would be difficult to sort out the various species if we didn't have the knowledge of how to identify a species. Imagine working in a grocery store and one of your coworkers asks you to bring up one of those wing diggers for pricing. You are likely going to be looking for a while. This is why grocery stores are organized in a very specific way and each product has its own label for identification. Plants may not have labels for identification, but they do have very specific structures that differentiate them from another species. In order to identify a plant, you must be knowledgeable of the main structures by which a plant can be identified. These main structures include flowers, leaves, stems, and roots. A species of a plant can most easily be identified by its flowers. These structures, which are used for sexual reproduction, can be distinguished based upon their flower colors, shapes, and arrangements. It is also important to note that fruits, which bear seeds, are the product of a fertilized alveole developing in a plant's ovary and can also be used in identification. For example, this miniature lupin produces bean pods, 
which means it can be identified as a part of the pea or Fabaceae family along with plants like clover. An inexpensive hand lens or magnifying glass is a useful tool for studying wildflowers and their fruits. Another useful tool for identifying plants is a ruler. These are both great tools for expanding your understanding and appreciation of the minute and intricate structures of such flowers. If flowers are not present, well, it's difficult to identify a plant by its flowers. Therefore, we must use another distinct structure for identification purposes. Here, we are going to examine the leaves. Leaves are categorized as being simple or compound. Simple leaves, like this oak leaf, have blades that are one continuous piece. Compound leaves have multiple leaflets. An example of a compound leaf type may be found on the lupin plant. Depending on the species, the compound and simple leaves may be toothed or smooth, lobed or entire, and smooth or fuzzy. Many of these structures are defined and illustrated in a quality field guide. The next step is to figure out how the leaves are attached to the plant stem. This is called leaf arrangement. Leaf arrangement may be opposite, alternate, or whorled. Opposite leaf arrangement consists of leaves attached to the stem opposite of each other. Alternate leaf arrangement consists of leaves alternately placed on each side of the stem. Whorled leaves are three or more leaves around a node on the stem. In addition, leaves may be present along the length of the stem or just at the base of the plant. You most likely will not be able to just walk through a field and identify all of the species you see from a standing perspective. Some of the features that make one plant distinct from another are small and may require you to get on your hands and knees or maybe even use a hand lens. Even then, the identification of a plant might require you to use a resource, such as an identification book like National Audubon Society Field Guide to Wildflowers for the Western Region. These books are typically specific to wildflowers found in a region or state and are organized by flower arrangement and color. Although the pictures are pretty, don't be afraid to explore the rest of the book and its enlightening literature. Who would have thought using your resources and opening a book could be useful? All organisms can be identified by their common or scientific names. Since we are working with plants, we will use miniature lupin as an example. Miniature lupin is its common name. Lupinus bicolor is its scientific name. Multiple common names may exist for a single species. This is the reason behind developing scientific names using a system called binomial nomenclature, which was popularized by Carl Linnaeus in the mid-1700s. Each and every known species has a specific, unique, and meaningful scientific name that can be recognized by scientists from around the world. In other words, it prevents confusion. We now know that plants can be identified by carefully examining their external structures – flowers, leaves, stems, and roots. It is mind-boggling to think of the estimated 1.8 million named species that have been identified throughout history, 20% of which are plants. It seems like an impossible task to try to keep all of those individual species straight for identification purposes without putting them into groups. This is partially why scientists have developed biological classification schemes using taxonomic ranks. The eight taxonomic ranks are as follows. Domain, being the least specific, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Species being the most specific. 
these taxonomic ranks can be remembered by the acronym do kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach classification is the way scientists group organisms based on how closely they are related to one another with plants scientists look at the external and internal parts of a plant just as we did for identifying them however for classification they focus on the similarities and differences among different plant species and usually observe the flowers and fruits the most. Today, scientists often use similarities and differences in DNA sequences to determine relationships among plants. For our purposes, we will focus on similarities and differences in plant structure. For example, here we have four specimens from the Poaceae, or grass family. However, three of them are more closely related to one another than they are to the four specimen. Here is a hint. From left to right, the scientific names of these species are Aracariophyllae, Bromus tectorum, Bromus diandris, and Bromus hordiaceus. Can you figure out which one is least related to the others? If you answered Aracariophyllae as being different, from the bromus species, you are beginning to understand the classification system. It is helpful to make basic observations of each plant structure, know the anatomical parts of the plant, and have an understanding of classification when thinking about this question. Earlier, we discussed the use of the National Audubon Society Field Guide to Wildflowers booklet and its uses in identification. Now, if you look closely at the details of this book, you will also notice that it is organized based on taxonomic ranks and a classification system. Classification and identification are combined in this fashion in most technical keys. Scientists often use technical keys such as the flora of North America, which is much more specific than the general field guides previously referred to. They use these as a resource tool to identify a specimen and you could use them too, now that you have the basic knowledge of its organization. The Encyclopedia of Life is another great resource that can be used for classification purposes. Note that this resource employs the use of strong relationships between classification and identification in organizing its records. Taxonomy and scientific natural history are two of the most vital fields in biology for several reasons including increasing our understanding of conservation needs. Despite this fact, they remain as neglected disciplines of biology. Check out these resources to enhance your knowledge of these fields and their roles in modern science.